feeding the beast. Who is the beast? And why is it mentioned 340 times in our Bible? Well, let's break that down. Beast, without an S, meaning singular, all right, that's mentioned 158 times, which adds to a five, which means grace, right? Five is grace. All right, so with an S, meaning plural, beast with an S, is mentioned 182 times. All right, so that adds to an 11. So I pay attention to the math. I, I, it just, I really pay attention to the numbers. So 11 is Babylon, right? Genesis 11 is the account of the Tower of Babel, which God brought his hand down and confounded and scattered the people, confounded the language. So it's talking about this Babylonian satanic system of the beast, in which we are born into. I mean, the beast was here before we see our avatars being made in Genesis 1.26. For in one, oh, and also I just want to mention, talking about the numbers, so 182 plus 158 equals 340, right? Father God is number seven. So, we can see the beast was made in Genesis 1, 24. So we are fallen in this Babylon, Babylonian satanic beast simulation. Now hear that, it's a simulation. It's a constructed simulation. That's really what today's video is about, is this wheel within a wheel that's in the sky. So, so that you understand that we truly are in a bad angel, bad angel video game. <laughs> we should just do a whole bad angel series. Um, but this simulation, this construct, this wheel within a wheel, the only job it has is to control, to control us, to, um, to submit us to oppression, for us to suffer, for us to be in a constant state of enslavement, a constant state of fear, for that is the food source of the construct. The simulation requires our energy. It's a vampire that feeds on our emotion and the best, or I guess I would say the most heightened emotion that it loves is fear. Fear is what it feeds on. Not to say it doesn't feed on our blood. It does that as well. But fear is mentioned 528 times in the Bible. No coincidence there. Oppression is mentioned 118 times. We are here as souls in an avatar in our coats of skin that you can read about in Genesis. What is that? Three, it's after, it's after the fall. Genesis three, go read that. But we're here um, feeding this construct, this simulation. We're, we're feeding it fear. That's why from now on, since since 2020, from now on, it's going to be one fear of porn pandemic after another. It just is. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because we're getting we're coming upon a reset. And we are just continually submitting to authority. We are allowing these so-called leaders to control us. We are being programmed. We're being groomed and conditioned to accept the laws of the system, to follow along and not ask questions, right? To sit quietly and not storm the castle, to buy into the, what is now just laughable narrative, to care about politics, to pay and be indebted for decades for an education based on lies. 
enslavement to keep the simulation spinning, like being caught in a hamster wheel. I mean, okay, let's read Isaiah. What does Isaiah tell us in 61 verse 1? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's us, guys. We are in a prison. We are bound in a prison in an avatar coat of skin. So let's look up that word again. You know, I always read the Bible according to the concordance. The opening of the prison, that number is 6495. Guess what 6495 means? It means opening of the eyes wide. So that's opening of the eyes wide. And you look up eyes, and I've, I've got this later on in the video written out. Eyes mean the faculty of knowing, understanding, spiritual discernment, spiritual understanding, spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. We are bound by the programs of the system, the satanic system, the grooming, all of our education, all of what we think is history. It's all a lie. None of it's real. None of it's true. It's all a lie for our spiritual growth. Let's read on. So we are caught in a simulated wheel. It's a wheel within a wheel, just like Father God showed us through the eyes of Ezekiel. Now, I want you to read all of Ezekiel um, 1, but I'm going to start and I'm going to take us through verse 16 to 23. And I want you to really hear what's being said here. Now, of course, this is Father God. He's coming down. He's showing us the system, the construct. He's above it, as you'll see when you hear me say the word firmament. So just pay attention to what we're listening to here. Ezekiel, you know, two of the books in the Bible that are the hardest to read that tell us the most is Ezekiel and Job. Read them together. Really? We're gonna, I'm going to do some videos breaking down Ezekiel and Job, but they're, they're full of wisdom and knowledge. If you could understand what they're saying, there's spiritual maturity there. All right. So Ezekiel 1, verse 16, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Verse 17, when they went... They went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. Verse 18, as for the rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about, and them four, and their rings, or and their strakes. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went thither, was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels, and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above, and under the firmament were their wings. All right, so that terrible crystal is the firmament of waters that is um, keeping the second heavens in place. So Father God is in the third heavens. There's a firmament um, in the third heavens of water and fire. Right, you can read this description I just read you. It's the same description as in, oh, let me think here, Revelation 4, right? When John goes up to the throne room. This is, so John talks about this in Revelation as, as well. So for me, I see the Bible 
is full of stories, and I look at all those stories as parables, right? I, I spend time with the story. I don't read it for this for the story. I look into, as a parable, I look deeper, right? I look deeper into all of the stories because I, that's what the, it's, it's with that spiritual maturity that you can sit with the story, spend time here and understand what this is telling us. What I'm reading here in Ezekiel, for me, this is my lens where I'm at today. This is the wheel within the wheel. This is the construct. There's full of eyes. We'll get to, we'll get to the eye part later on. But I'm not coming from religious grooming, right? I don't have any of that dogma. I'm not coming from being conditioned. I got away from the church and away from my my Bible for over 30 years, and I went down a different path. You already, guys already know that, a new age path. But now I can come back having forgotten all of my church upbringing and whatever entrainment and conditioning I was given, I got, I lost all that, thankfully, because now I can come with fresh eyes and with critical thinking ability and read it without any type of theolo you know, theological training. I don't have theological training and I don't want to be taught by somebody who does. That's part of this system, all right? There's no truth in this system. You got to come to that on your own. You have to come to that on your own. Okay, so I see so much more than theology. Theology wants to entrain you for any and all theology is that which serves the simulation. All right, and somehow it serves the simulation. <clears throat> Why are there hundreds and hundreds of religion and hundreds, oh, there's over 400 versions of the Bible why do they leave out little words? You know, little words that mean a lot. There's just, there's a lot to take from. When you go through the concordance, there's a lot, it's a deeper meaning than what you're thinking it is on the surface. So, when you watch, if you, again, if you've been watching my videos, Holy Spirit keeps taking me back to Genesis 1. Right, every no matter what I do, it's it's insane how I I can't get away from Genesis one. All roads leads back to Genesis one. Why is that? At this point, I understand the setting up of the system. Genesis one is a story. It's a reset story. Okay, Genesis one is a reset story, and it was right there in the first two sentences. In the first two sentences, it's telling you it's a reset. And it's a setup of a dark kingdom that our that we our soul is going to be breathed into an avatar suit, right? It's a setup of of the satanic dark kingdom, this system, this construct, this simulation, this matrix, this wheel within a wheel that we are in. That's what Genesis one is, and the beast, the beast is created before we are. The beast is created in Genesis. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast, number 2416, beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so, the beast simulated system was made and then our avatar is made as you can read on in Genesis verse 26. I've read Genesis 1, I mean like, I don't know, 500 times it seems like, every day, every day. For however many days I've been at this, it's probably 500, it's probably a good guess. I have been taken back to Genesis 1, so I could keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into understanding the simulation, the construct, the wheel within the wheel, the matrix, all of that applies. So, and again, this is my lens, but this is where I'm at. We are given stories like Moses from the beginning to get way more out of it, way more out of it than the, what the church want you to know or understand. As a parable for me today, I see the law of Moses is the initial trap in this wheel, this constructed video game, AI virtual reality of fear porn, of submission to the so-called 
leaders, authority, kings, queens, whatever. I see this as following the herd over a cliff like demons and the pigs. I look at all of that. I don't take any one sentence in the Bible as just a sentence. I look deeper into what is it? There is a reason that every single word in the Bible is there, every single line, the way the words are put together. You have to stop and think, why does it say it like that? Why is that story being told? Why do we need to know about the demons and the pigs going over the cliff? For me, and again, this is me, but these are stories of enlightenment and not enslavement. We should grow in our wisdom and love and grace for our Father God and not let anyone but your level of awareness and understanding and holy discernment guide you and not the system, the satanic system. Satan is a system. We got we to gotta understand that. So your only choice is to break free and graduate out of the darkness first before you can hold the light. For you can be the light. You have to shed the darkness like a snake skin. You must shed the skin suit. That is how I see the parable of Moses. Okay, so let's just read Exodus 2.10. And the child grew. And she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called him Moses. Moses, by the way, means drawn. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. So when I was reading this the other day, right here, the Holy Spirit stopped me. And I could not go further until I understand that verse. I mean, literally, the Holy Spirit jumps in me when I read something, just like, when Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist and he jumped when he heard Mary announce she was pregnant. Okay, I'll read that verse, by the way, later on. But I know to stop. And when I, even really before the Holy Spirit even jumped, when I read, drew him out of water, I just said, right there's something very profound. I mean, that to me was profound. It wasn't just picking a baby up out of a basket. You know, it was, it was a profound statement. So I immediately was transported. It's almost like I was there. I, I read that and then I was immediately, I, I was like at the fence, right? The, enclo the enclosure in the garden, the garden was enclosed. And it was like I was standing at the fence and I was watching the snake pull Eve out of her body of living water. That's what I saw. I saw the snake getting Eve to eat the grape, and I saw Eve being pulled out of her living water system, the blood of the grape. Have I lost you? Let's, let's look at this through the concordance. I drew him out of the water is number 4325. Now, I've talked about this a lot on videos, um, but 4325, that meaning is urine, semen, piss, wasting water, water of the feet, water of the feet, and urine of danger, violence, and transitory things. Seems like a strange meaning to you, right? I mean, does everybody want to swim in that? Surf's up, right? I mean, that's a strange meaning for waters. Not many people would even go to the concordance and look for that. Your church isn't doing that. I guarantee you that. So again, all roads lead back. Where do we first find the number 4325? It's in Genesis 1 and verse 2. All right, let's read it. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Right there, waters is 4325. All right. So these are, these are what grabs my attention. This is how I think. You know, I, I know that the simplest, simple, simple sentences are where you're going to get the biggest impact. The profound is in the simple. So right here for me, um, and some, I've heard some Bible scholars agree, 
And that doesn't matter to me if they agree or not, but I call it the flood of Satan. And the beginning of this uh, construct, matrix, simulation, wheel within the wheel. That's what I see here. It's a reset story. It's a reset. So we have Satan and the, his one-third trafficked, agreeable, stupid angels fell with him. One thing I got to throw in, how many times, especially in the Psalms, you, we talk about sea monsters. <laughs> what is in this water? Sea monsters, river monsters are everywhere. This is, we are being told, this is a satanic, a satanic water system now turned to blood. But it's Satan's dead piss wasting urine for waters. This is the deadly waters of Satan's world, his virtual reality of darkness, that the face of God is moving on the face. Here we are told that we are under God's feet. He's above the firmament. We're trapped. Okay, we're in a wheel within a wheel. We're trapped. We're in a hamster wheel. So we're in a world that's ruled by Satan. And this is a world of darkness. And that only God, Jesus, can give us eternal living waters in which we will never thirst. Now, I did a Bible study on those verses. And that video is called The Parable of Moses, part one and two. They're up on YouTube. Um, but the point that I want to make in this video is about the simulation. We are in as a, a metaphor, an analogy of school, right? We must graduate to that white robe. No coincidence, right? In schools today, when you graduate, everyone is in a black robe. You think that's a coincidence? Not only are they in a black robe, they've got a cube on their head, a cube is always represents Satan's. It's Satan's enclosure of the inverted cross. So what a cube is, it's an inverted cross. Okay, so Moses was drew out is a reason for that number, 4325, for that is not the number or meaning for waters found in other verses. Pay attention when the number's 4325. Look deeper into that. And again, you have to read it with a concordance. You just have to. And as I've said before, you're going to find when you do that with a concordance, the most simple sentence have the biggest story. There's, there's, there's a deep meaning. And you're not going to understand it or get it or feel it without the Holy Spirit discernment. You know, you can't go at it with training or conditioning. It's just got to be you in the living word. So Moses brings us the law, but more important, right away, as soon as he brings us the law, he's born, and right away, what is it? Verse 11, he's looking at his brothers enslaved. So, Again, make sure you, you see Moses part one and part two. I just Moses is just a much bigger story than what you probably have been told or believe or have read. It's something a little deeper. Again, it's my lens, but the bottom line is we are in a satanic blood system that is turned upside down and backwards, and we must turn ourselves right side up in order to hold the light. It's like the oil lamp parable. So that's why my oil lamp is always on. So we have to develop our eyes and our ears. Does it not say constantly for those with eyes to see and ears to hear? That has to be developed. You don't just come into this system and have eyes to see and ears to hear. Why? Because we're bombarded. We're dumbed down to a constant pounding of lies. And until we mature and release ourselves and not fall under the ways of this system, which is the only truth of this reality, we are here under grace. We are here under the grace of God, not the law of Moses. The law of Moses is a trap. Right here, we are given the story of slavery right away. 
Moses is named, and right there it begins the enslavement process. We are shown the controlling law of the God snake, snake God, Jehovah, which hijacked that name. And this snake God is always clothed in thick darkness, thick, dark clouds. Why is this? There's only one answer. They fell from the light. They are the devil and is trafficked again, one-third fallen angels. They are running around as little G-gods creating the system, running the system. And even if you do not think you are a slave, the money is the slave masters. All right, we read this in Matthew 6, verse 24. No one, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Again, it's repeated in another way in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. All right, that's just two verses out of hundreds, really. But going back to Moses and his snake god in his thick, dark clouds, with the law, the oppression, and the fear, the idea that there is such a thing of authority, a king who can do whatever he please, the pyramid of power that is the tyranny of this simulation. And if you respond to it, you, it will continue to keep you in the game with no light at the end of the tunnel. What the system cannot recognize is the light, the joy, the holy, the happiness. It will respond, however, Big time to darkness, fleshly desires, fear, terror, suffering, depression. It will possess those in this state of being and keep them trapped in the wheel of that which we think is life. It is not who we are. We are trapped in a suit of skin for the purposes of learning the simulation, not feeding the wheel full of eyes. Why do the wheels have eyes? Well, let's read. Ezekiel 10, verse 12. And their whole body, their rims, and their spokes, their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes all around, the wheels that the four of them had. Well, let's read it again in Revelation 4, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, day and night. They never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All right, eyes here in both verses is the number 3788. That number means the eyes of the mind, the faculty of knowing. Zechariah 4.10, For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Proverbs 15.3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this. From now on, you will have wars. Second Kings 2, I mean, sorry, Second Kings 6. Verse 17, then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What does that mean? There are angels. There are holy angel armies, right? There's holy angels, armies of them. Warrior angels are all over in this simulation, Sometimes they come below the wheel, and sometimes they're above the wheel. They're all over. They're above and below the wheel. There's no, there's no governor on the holy angels. They can be and do whatever is needed of them. Whatever is called upon them happens. They do it. So they're, they're helping us. So let's go back to Moses. He was strung along in this game, and he never made it to the promised land. For the the, the uh, snake god, <laughs> oh, poor guy, he never made it to the promised land because he just kept following 
right? The snake God. But who do we see with Jesus on the mountain at his transfiguration? All right, let's read Luke 9, 28 through 36. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went upon the mountain to pray. And he was praying. The appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. Now, you got to stop right there. What they're trying to tell us, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Now, a couple of things to look at here. One is Moses, which is probably goes against the snake simulation. We might figure something out there that the church will not teach you which is why the devil wanted the body of Moses. For me, this is what I see. This is where I am in my growth. Why does the devil want the body of Moses? He wants to stop this being shown Moses at the transfiguration. Okay, so we can read about this. Let's read Jude 1, verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Durst did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Even Michael himself has to say the Lord. And I want you to look here. The Lord, that number is 2962. Unlike Jehovah snake God, that number is 3068. So this is really Father God. Father God's number, when reading in the um, concordance, is his number is 2962. 2962. So always look at that. When you see Lord, Lord is a title. You can be an owner of a vineyard and be called Lord. Okay, Lord is just a title. But 2962 is the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord rebuked thee. So he was talking to Snake God, which uses the number 3068, which means Jehovah, the existing one. Yeah, he's existing. He's first to be made. So he's an eternal, eternal being. But also what I see here has always been about grace and never law. Okay, that is the trap. That's what I'm trying to point out. The trap and the lie of Moses. The, the, you know, okay, Moses was left behind. Pun intended. I'm serious. Not really think about that. We are promised the promised land. But Moses was never to get it. He never figured out the trap. He never figured out the snake God. He did not graduate. But since the law of the land is a lie, and by grace was on purpose shown with Jesus as his grace allowed Moses to be with him, Father God. Even if we get left behind, all right, even if we get recycled back into the wheel, one day we will graduate and get to the true kingdom. Now, in reading the account of Luke at the end, what is it telling us? Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw the glory. And the two men who stood with him, Peter, James, and John, were heavy with sleep. That's us. We're heavy with sleep. We're program groomed, dumbed down, conditioned, entrained to the ways of this world, to the darkness to the systems, to the fleshly desires, the lust, the entertainment of this world keeps us in the trap. As long as you want what is of this world, you cannot know the light and God's kingdom. You're too entertained by this world. You want what this world has to offer. Stop it. Do not like the ways or the desires or the lust or anything of this world. It's the exact opposite of Father God. It is dark. It's entertaining. It's distracting. It's loud. And it's dark. So, once you have the eyes to see, only then can you handle 
the glory. So another thought from my lens is just like Adam was a foreshadow of Jesus, so was Elijah and Moses. Of course, there has to be three foreshadows of Jesus. So before Jesus was here, we had Moses and Elijah. And they did the same thing that Jesus did. All right. They too went for 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. So in Elijah, you can read about this in 1 Kings 19, verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went into and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. It's a foreshadow of Jesus. Moses is a foreshadow of Jesus. Moses, Exodus 34, verse 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Did He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So Jesus does this as well. And we can read about it in Mark 1, verse 12 and 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. I just got to stop right there and point out, isn't that awesome? The angels were ministering to God himself. God made the angels. Well, I wonder, don't you wonder, what is the ministering going on right there? I mean, is it straight from the sacred texts that have already been written by, let's say, Isaiah? I mean, what's going on here? What are they ministering? I just love that. I love to sit and think about that. What possibly could the angels be ministering to Father God? But that's pretty cool, right? I just got to point out right here. You know, while I always ask my holy angels to minister to me, and I know that my, my soul is hearing it, um, but I want my consciousness to hear it as well. So I have on my phone an Audible app, and on the Audible it has the King James, um, the King James Bible uh, being talk, you know, talking to you. In other words, it's it's a the Bible is being read to you, and so every single night I put I put I turn on Audible, and I start with Nehemiah, and so at night while I'm sleeping. Just, you know, the Bible yourself, start at Nehemiah, and I wake up normally somewhere either uh, midway through Isaiah. Um, so that means I've, ha I've heard all the Psalms, I've heard, I've heard Job, I've heard all the Psalms, I've heard the Proverbs, I've heard Ecclesiastes. You know, I make it to somewhere between Isaiah, mid-Isaiah, and sometimes I'm even in Jeremiah before I wake up. But the point is, my body goes into the most profound deep sleep while my spirit, my soul is being ministered to, my consciousness is being ministered to by my favorite books in the Bible. Job, the Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Proverbs. It's really wonderful. It's a wonderful way to sleep. Just putting that out there, that's an option for you. But it only makes sense, right, that there would be three foreshadows before Jesus, at least to me. Uh, let's look at the similarities between Jesus and Moses. Moses' first miracle is turning all of the water, not just the Nile, but all of the water everywhere to blood. Jesus turns water into wine. If you look at that number, 1818, it actually said, which is blood. So if you look at the number blood is 1818, and it says the juice of the grape, the blood of the wine. That's what it says in concordance. Blood means the juice of the grape, blood of the wine. That's what happened to Eve. She was a living water system, and she became a blood satanic system. That's why the snake God requires and demands and barks out orders of blood sacrifice, blood offerings. It's only the snake and his fallen angels require blood. They probably require that to not age or degrade as fast. That's just my lens. I'm just saying, I know that they eat flesh. I know that they drink blood. And I believe that's for them to not degrade so bad. And they're also usurping all of the fresh water on this planet. So Moses is drew up. 
out of piss wasting urine waters of the flood of Satan in Genesis 1, 1 verse 2. And he turns those very same waters into blood as the story is much bigger. The story here is much bigger than the religious dogma would tell you. Right? We are born, our souls take on what is not originally our bodies. We originally are in a different body. That is the immortal living waters of Jesus. Once Eve ate the grape, her water is no longer living. It turned to blood and became mortal. Death. Death is what happened. And we're given a suit of skin. Read that in Genesis 3, verse 21. Unto Adam, also unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. This too is the story of Moses, the second foreshadow of Jesus, like Adam. This to me affirms the Holy Spirit in me, for he jumped in me when I read the last words in Exodus 2.10 at the start of this video. I already read that. I knew this was something much larger than removing a baby from a basket. It was like when John jumped in Elizabeth's womb when Mary told her she was with child. Read that in Luke 1, verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So I will wrap up here, and I hope to encourage you to read and discern for your own growth, going past the need for a pastor. For the church today is dying at a rapid pace. According to the first blog, that came up on Google about this topic showed in 2003, church attendance was 51%, and in 2020, it was 25%. Now, I know the year 2020, all the churches closed, but still, um, 2023, it's even less. So we are on our own when it comes to our growth, and right now, we really need a growth spurt of wisdom before the evil is, you know, just all out on the surface I got to pause right here and say the biggest movie of 2023, even though it's only J January, what, 25 today, but still the movie that's made more money, even more money than Avatar, The Way of Water is the most demonic movie called Megan that in its opening weekend made $45 million. That's how much people are entertained by demons. And it's rated PG-13. If you don't think we're at the end, that should tell you something. The story of Genesis 1 is a reset story. It says so in the first two sentences. And in verse 28, it says, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. That's what it actually says in the King James Bible. But every other translation other than King James, which is why I only read King James, Every other Bible took out the word replenish. And if you listen to 99% of all the pastors out there read this verse, which is almost never, if they actually do read this verse, they leave out the word replenish. They leave it out. I listened to a very well-respected, big uh, a pastor that had a huge following, and he read verse 28, and he did not use the word replenish. The church, the pastors cannot deal with the facts of the Bible. They can't explain this reset story. They don't have any grounds. They cannot understand, explain the supernatural, the paranormal that is the Bible. They can't really tell you what Revelation is actually teaching you. It's a bad satanic system. I'm sorry, I know that's blasphemous. But I'm asking you, we're coming to a time where you're going to have to read and think on your own. You're, you cannot depend on somebody else for your spiritual maturity. You cannot trust that there is truth in any institution in this matrix, in this construct, in this simulation, in this wheel within a wheel. You must think and read, for there is truth out there. There are sacred texts that have been left behind. Yes, the King James Bible. But there are also books, there are texts, there are scrolls that were pulled out because they did not serve the Dark Lord's agenda, the Dark Lord's construct, all right? Those books were the most dangerous 
the Apocrypha was the most dangerous, the Colburn Bible right here. Too much wisdom. Too, it, it can't, it, this, this right here can advance your spiritual maturity like, like uh, it's just gangbusters. This is, a, this is some, the wisdom in here, um, oh, I, read my, I read more time is spent in the King James Bible, but I'll take 30, 60 minutes and I'll read some of this wisdom because it's just good. It's just goodness. I can read the Apocrypha. You know, it's just goodness. It really is. It's okay to read good. It's okay to be entertained with spiritual maturity. That's okay. It's okay not to serve the dark Lord in this dark system. But what are we, what are we coming upon as I wrap this up? I see that we are very near another reset. The wheel, the construct in the sky is going to fall apart. It has in many times. You can go through for fun. You can go through and list, or I mean, do, I guess I would say history searchers, how many times gigantic pieces of steel fell out of the sky when there was no such thing as steel. It's there. The respect, the reset is going to happen in every aspect of life. It's going to happen with the regime, the money, the division now of you. It's, it's not, it's not uh, today's narrative is you can't be human. No, you got to identify as something other than human. I mean, I, I just got to say, dare I say, we have come to a point of downright stupid. I'm sorry, but we have. I mean, look at the jackals that are in charge. There is not an ounce of intelligence. It, you, you, can't, you cannot find any intelligence in the highest offices of the land. Zero, none. I mean, they're literally kangaroos. We now have kangaroos as our leaders. We have clowns. We have drag queens. These are our leaders. The church is just a circus. The schools, they're promoting litter boxes in the classrooms since we know now you want to identify as a cat. How much lower can we get? The fear porn will absolutely increase. All right. It's food for the beast. So yes, darkness will grow. So do not follow the next new narrative. There's going to be another new narrative. It's going to be darker, more evil, and more downright stupid. Be glad to graduate out of this beast construct. Do not participate in any system that this game provides. It will not help you get your white robe. Wearing the black robes they give you is not for your benefit. You were not trained in some higher education. You were trained to be more stupid and to spread the foolishness, the darkness. You're not a, pro a professor of anything other than darkness, period. There is no training needed, all right? Just sit in your cave, whatever your cave is, and read. And you too will come to the awareness that we have been in a wheel for who knows how long, but our soul is ripe now for the harvest. Call it the harvest, call it the resurrection, the rapture, change in a twinkling of an eye. We are going to get back our glorified body. We have been in the dark ages. We have been programmed. We have been terrorized. We have been beaten and tortured. We have suffered all for our empowerment, our enlightenment. I mean, is that not what Jesus showed us? Did he not go through all of that for a reason? He showed us, yeah, it's, it's been bad. I'm going to go through it too, but you're going to be like me. You're going to be at a transfiguration time. There's going to be a time where you too will resurrect and be transfigurated. We are going to follow in his footsteps when you're ready. So what do we do? What do we do until we're ready? Well, okay, let's look to the prophets. Let's Go back and read Isaiah 61, 1. I read it at the beginning of the video. Isaiah tells us what are we to do until we graduate. Isaiah 61, 1. Or 
go and read what Jesus tells us to do, right? Jesus himself, our main prophet, what does Jesus tell us in Matthew 25? Read verses 35 to 40. I want you to get in your Bible and read that now. Matthew 25, verse 35 to verse 40. So for me personally, this is what I do. You know, 90% of all the money I make, I give it away. I, for me, I give it away to single moms. I just, I do not care about anything that is of this world. All right. And the money is part of that. I'm not going to be enslaved to that. I'll be fine. I trust. All right. I stick to reading. For me, what the Holy Spirit leads me to read. And I make videos hoping that some young soul may benefit and get out of this world of lies, not want to partake, not to be groomed, right? That, that they may get out of the world of the, the, the lies and the grooming and the darkness that's on the rise. Keep your eyes on the skies for all the lying signs and wonders, for they are here now. The lying signs and wonders in the skies are going to continue to show itself as this reset draws near as a construct the construct a simulation it's going to fall apart like a scroll in the heavens the heavens are going to scroll back it says it right there in revelations what is it telling us the heavens can scroll back because it's an illusion it's a construct it's a matrix it's a system and it's going to reveal itself for those who are ready for the rapture. And all God's people said, Amen.